Hello, welcome to the Stroke Special Interest Group Student Corner. My name is Heather Hayes. I'm the chair of the Stroke Special Interest Group, and I am a faculty member at the University of Utah, neurologic clinical specialist, and very happy to be here today with Kylie, who will introduce herself uh, as we are discussing the uh, AFOs with a patient and what might be the application and use of the clinical practice guidelines. So welcome, Kylie, very happy to have you here. Hi, thank you. My name is Kylie Roberts, and I am a third year student at Sacred Heart University. Fantastic. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share the screen here, and I'm going to ask you as we start that you have a conversation and tell us a little bit about the patient that you have been working with. Um, yeah, of course. So we were introduced to this individual. He is a 21 year old male and he is eight months post-stroke uh, post with right hemiparesis and aphasia as well. So prior to his stroke, he was a very active individual. Uh, he participated in basketball, hunting, fishing, hiking, free weights, uh, so very active and involved. Uh, his goal is to return to college. And then when asked another goal, he said that it is to improve his right ankle or make his right ankle better. Um, so kind of a vague statement. So we would want to delve a little bit deeper on that. Does he want to improve the strength, the muscle activation, uh, the walking endurance? Um, so we would have to delve a little bit deeper uh, as to what improving his right ankle means. Um, he has no falls in the past two months because he has been being more, he has been more cautious and he currently does not wear an AFO or a brace. Okay, and to clarify, um, he used to wear one. And um, as we will see a common uh, response for young individuals is to get rid of that as quickly as possible. <laughs> so on our evaluation, what are some things that you have found? Yeah, so we saw a decreased light touch and sharp dull in his right lower extremity. And then in addition, we did a gait analysis, um, which we'll put on the screen now so we could see his gait. What we noted with his gait is, so just a reminder, he has that right hemiparesis. Um, so most uh, foremost, you could see that he has that foot drop. So you could see that, especially when he's walking straight towards the camera, uh, that right foot drop is very apparent. And then on that turn down the hallway, you can notice that he has a steppage gait. So really trying to flex through the hip in order to clear that right lower extremity. And then he also circumducts as well on the turn to clear because he has that weakness going into dorsiflexion. In addition, you could see throughout uh, this video that he has increased stance time on his left lower extremity, and he only pivots on his left during turn. So whether he's walking down the hallway and turning or turning to sit in the chair, he pivots on that left lower extremity during the turns. Um, in addition, during his backwards walking, you could see he has uh, the decreased stance time on the right lower extremity. So he's more on that left lower extremity. And you also see that flexor synergy in his right lower extremity kick in. So he can't really uh, differentiate and get that hip flexion on that right side because he's going into that flexion synergy. Um, so that's something to note when he walks backwards. Hip extension. So trying to do um, knee flexion and hip extension is what's, what is difficult on that um, backwards walking. Yes, fantastic. Also becomes a little bit more compromised on that foot when you step backwards uh, with that weakness. Trying to put mm -hmm. your toes down can sometimes be a little bit scary for individuals. Okay, and so also um, you were able to do some outcome measures. Let's take a look mm -hmm. at some of the outcome measures. Yeah, so we did a few outcome measures. So the first one was the 10 meter self-selected pace. So he did that in 10.1 seconds, which was 0.99 meters per second. Then he did the 10 meters fast pace, which was 9.57 seconds, which was 1.04 meters per second. We did the timed up and go, which was 12.72 seconds. 
And then we did the three meters back, which was 20.23 seconds. And then the Berg balance scale, uh, which he scored a 52 out of 56. And just to note on that, he had difficulty with turning and then standing on the one foot, which was the right foot. So just going to show that kind of lines up with what we saw in the gait analysis, not wanting to be on that right leg and difficulty with the turns. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And um, also this individual does not show much difference between self-selected and fast. Uh, so he doesn't ha really have, I mean, he's, he's not a bad walker, but he cannot demonstrate that faster walk. And then that backwards three meter back is also quite impaired. I mean, 20 seconds to only go three meters is, is a very difficult task uh, for somebody this young. And especially for, if he wants to return to hiking and basketball and those more dynamic activities. And the last thing is, if anybody has other questions about how to interpret these outcome assessments, they can go to another stroke corner, uh, student corner uh, video that describes what the MCID and how best to help to interpret these activities. So as we have taken a look at this patient, I think it's uh, very appropriate to ask the question, the clinical question, is an AFO or an FES appropriate for this patient? And the good news is we now have a clinical practice guideline that can help us identify just the step of, is this something that we want to discuss? Uh, we understand that there are some, some barriers to this individual and the use of an AFO since he's already had one and gotten rid of it. This is going to be a tricky conversation for us. And so let's take a look at what the clinical practice guidelines has to offer. So I have the link up here for um, where they can find the AFO clinical practice guidelines and some of the other practice resources, which we'll be showing you. It's titled a clinical practice guideline for the use of AFO and functional ESTEM post-stroke. So the nice thing is this is gonna guide us for individuals post-stroke immediately um, here to provide us that information. So one of the things that's interesting about the clinical practice guidelines is it divides, it took information about quality of life, strength and muscle activation, walking endurance, tone spasticity, kinematics, dynamic balance and gait speed and for example, gait speed's an easy one. It said, let's look at the literature and we're gonna ask the question if gait speed improved or not using an AFO in the chronic stage or acute stage, using FES in the chronic or acute stage. And we're gonna look at the data on whether there was an immediate effect, uh, a therapeutic effect or a long-term effect or combined and assess what, what these changes were. And it's done this for each of these categories. And so as we're thinking about our patient and knowing that each of these could be important or not important to this individual. And earlier on, Kylie, when you mentioned that he said he wants to improve his right ankle, what does that mean? And we're only going to hypothesize because we don't have the answer, but what might that mean to him um, as we're thinking about these categories as, about what we want to choose for, an, for a bracing? Yeah, so especially as a young ind individual, he's 21 years old, um, we could hypothesize that making his right ankle better. Um, maybe that's strength and muscle activation. Maybe, especially as a 21 year old, we identified that he definitely has that uh, foot drop and that slap as, um, in his stance phase. So maybe it's the kinematics, which he might not say outright, it's my kinematics, um, but he might say, I'm not walking normally. I feel like my, my right foot's just dropping down when, when I go to step. So maybe it's strength and muscle activation kind of feeds into playing and into that kinematics as well. Um, so maybe we could deduce it's the strength and muscle activation or maybe his kinematics so we can take a look. Okay, great. And I think this is gonna help us know how to interact with him of what might be our point for helping him understand why this might be a beneficial tool for him. Okay, so the one of the things that has been produced by the Academy is a quick reference guide. And this is such a great tool because we can just look at the different components of we just as we've just discussed. So for example, if we just look at the quick reference on our walking endurance, we may want to provide an AFO or FES for acute, but we really should consider providing an AFO or FES for our chronic patients to improve walking endurance. So that's a really nice um, quick reference for us to, to know what to have and putting this up in the clinic. So if we come into what he's discussing, strength and muscle activation, we may want to provide an AFO with decreased stiffness, but we really should provide this um, an FES for our patients with chronic. So right now I would agree that this seems like a really great choice for this individual and FES um, in this chronic stage. And what we'll find that we may be able to, to tap into improving some of these other components such as dynamic balance we should provide, may help us with our gait speed, uh, may help us with our other mobility. So these are things that um, 
kit that could help us sell this if we think this is an important tool for our individual as our conversation and our relationship with him develops and grows. So basically here's what the uh, statement says, action statement seven for strength and muscle activation, just as an example of how to use the guide. This is one that we're gonna pick today to decide if this is a, if this is a, a direction for him. So clinicians may provide an AFO with decreased stiffness for individuals with decreased lower extremity motor control, which is exactly what he has. It's not a lot of spasticity, it's just motor control due to acute or chronic post-stroke hemiplegia and specifically goals to allow activation of the anterior tib and gastroxoleus, so both, that's fantastic, while walking with the AFO. Clinicians should provide FES for individuals with decreased lower extremity motor control to chronic post-stroke hemiplegia who have goals to improve activation of the anterior tib while walking without FES. So FES can be a tool, as you know, to help us recruit that anterior tib and then help us down the line to get rid of this device. Now, both of these have evidence quality of two and the recommendation strength is moderate. So you may think, well, that doesn't sound fantastic, but I also wanna think of this as a tool to help us. This does not mean that we're gonna put it on him forever and we're gonna absolutely increase his strength. We still have to do other things to help, but this is a, a something that we may wanna consider. So at this point, and Kylie, let me know if you agree, I think an FES would be the conversation. Exactly, I totally agree. And especially um, appealing to that second statement on the slide, he is a 21 year old and he's not gonna to wanna to be wearing this all the time for permanent, but the whole point of the CPG is saying that it's improving activation when he's walking without the FES in the future. Um, so I think that's gonna be the big driving point of this 21 year old who trialed an AFO in the past, didn't use it, um, maybe really appealing the FES to him and the fact that it'll help him walk um, and increase his strength and muscle activation when he's not wearing it even. It's gonna be the big uh, point to make with him. Good, fantastic. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting is let's consider, um, this is just a summary of what we've just said, but let's consider what well, the nice thing about the CPG is it gives us the benefits and the risk and harms and costs. And this is, if you already know this up front, it's a great way to have the conversation. Like I know an FES is difficult to get covered. Um, and so sometimes we don't wanna run, run recommend it because it's so difficult. And he may or may not have insurance that's gonna cover it. Can he do something with uh, GoFundMe and, and utilize this or use a trial period or can he use mine in the clinic for a little while? So costs are always an issue for us. An interesting statement that they make is that falls may increase with AFOs and FES because we're asking them to move more. Now that's a really interesting concept. He's somebody that I would hope to say, let's get you moving more and let's get you hiking. <laughs> and yes, it, we may have to troubleshoot that a little bit and then may have falls, but at least I know you're moving. And then of course, as we've already seen the abandonment of the AFOs, you know, is the bang worth the buck? And that really is what we're talking about here. I think he got rid of the AFO because it was not uh, attractive. It did not fit with his lifestyle. And so going without the AFO was probably the easiest. And, and I understand that concern as well. So FES is kind of a nice way because it's not as unattractive, but there are risks and harms and costs uh, when associating, when, when thinking about these tools. So the last thing here, let's take a look at is in these, in the CPG, you will find the actual articles that help come to that level of evidence of two in summary, as well as uh, the moderate um, overall. And so if we look at Kotnick in 2008, who did an implanted FES for our chronic patients, uh, increased the tibialis anterior and gastroc but there was no effect on the peroneus longus or the soleus after the 24 week mark. So this is maybe a too long of a time period and we certainly aren't gonna be doing implants. Um, and if you take a look at these others, I don't know what some of these are, but I can discuss the walk aid and the level of evidence is four. So it was not a very strong evidence coming out of this and demonstrated an increase in tibialis anterior at four weeks. So. The literature, I would say, is not convincing to say that, yes, we're going to be increasing strength, but I don't think that that's our only purpose in making this recommendation. And so as I think about this, Kylie, I think that this is, you know, one example of, yeah, I'd like to be stronger. Okay, this is an option. It's not a guarantee, um, but we may want to sell this on other pieces of, you know, what about if I could get you walking and hiking? 
temporarily, would that be a good option for you so that I can get your hips stronger, you stronger, you starting to feel like you're participating more in life. Um, and this is a temporary mode. So I think those are all conversations to have. And okay. And then lastly, this is an area, Kylie, that you know is a concern. What What is kind of the next steps and what does the CPG not offer us? Exactly. I feel like the um, as a student, the CPG really gives you that baseline. Should you prescribe an AFO or FES or not? Um, but it doesn't really delve into what type of AFO if you do decide that an AFO is right for the patient. Um, but this is kind of like a case by case basis, depending on each patient, um, exactly what type of AFO you would give them, which is what the CPG does not address. Um, but we talked about maybe in a future video, we could watch this case back again, the video um, and kind of figure out which type of AFO specifically would be right for this patient. Fantastic. And um, so what I have, you know, kind of what we have summarized, and I think it's really nice is we have a lot of decision making to make here as clinicians, we're not losing our capacity for decision making because of these guidelines. We now have a reference to help us talk to the patient about, you know, when I think about this, uh, you know, if I can improve your walking ability, and I can improve your endurance, I'm using those words, because that's the what the literature shows. But you know, if, if you wanted to be able to attempt to play basketball and go a little bit faster, this is going to make you a lot safer on the basketball um, field, right? Um, he, we still have a deficit in the right upper extremity, but you know, what are things that he could do to start participate a little bit more? And so the CPG is a tool to help us that first question, which is really important. Why, why are we doing it? What's the patient's goals? Com communicating that and having that. And then we can go to our um, orthotist and say, we now know this is what we want to do. We're very interested in FES. Um, how is this process going to work? Okay, that wasn't the best one. What's our backup? And really deciding what might be the best tool for this individual and coming back with it and with our expertise. Um, any other questions that you would like to share or ask? No, no, no other questions really. I think this is a good tool, the quick reference specifically. It's one sheet, bring it to clinical, have a discussion with your CI. It's, it's a brand new CPG too, came out in 2021. So this could be something that you could bring into the clinic too. So exciting. <laughs> Good. Fantastic. Yes, I agree. Let's share it. Um, so thank you. And hope we will come back and do another one with an orthotist. And I appreciate your time. And I hope that other students will pay attention to some of the other videos that we have out there. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.